In this video, we're gonna install Django Channels, actually more specifically Django Channels 2. So what is Django Channels, you might ask? This is the, I guess, the, the tool, the, the Django tool or the Python tool that is developed so that you can use things like WebSockets and serve them as an ASGI application in your Django project. Now, if you don't know what ASGI is and you don't know what WSGI is or any of these things that I'm saying, don't worry because I'm going to show you everything that you need to know in this video. So if you know absolutely nothing, you're still going to be able to get through this, don't worry. Throughout this video, I'm gonna be referencing the Django documentation because I think it's a great resource for, uh, well, especially for Django channels, but most things, anytime there's a new kind of thing, the documentation is typically where you want to start. So here I am in channels.readthedocs.io and I'm at the uh, installation section, installing the latest version. And this is what we need to write into our command prompt to install Django channels or to get started installing Django channels. So I'm going to stop my development environment and I'm going to uh, paste that in. So Python dash M pip install U Django channels. And I'm installing that into the virtual environment. So pressing enter on that. And hopefully this works without any issues the first time. I've, I've had issues in the past. Um, I actually kind of want to warn you about one specific issue. If you get any kind of a warning here that says something about uh, Microsoft Visual Studio, especially if you're on Windows, obviously Microsoft Visual Studio is, is not going to be an issue if you're not on Windows, you might have to update the build tool. So if you get some kind of an error saying something about Microsoft build tools, this is what you need to do. Go to this URL. It's going to be down in the description of the video. If you're not watching this video on my website, you're going to need to go to my website to get these links because that is the better place to watch this. Also, pretty soon this stuff is not going to be free anymore. You're going to have to pay for this. So you might as well just go to my website now, register an account and uh, start watching the videos there. So uh, you click on download build tools. You would select whatever, um, or I guess it would just start downloading and then you would execute it and then try installing uh, doing that installation again. So you would do again, uh, Python m install or pip install u channels. Uh, if that still doesn't work, try, just try pip install channels, see if that works. Uh, if that doesn't work, then I don't know, you're gonna have to Google whatever kind of error you get. But I think at this point, you should probably be good. Okay, so now that we have channels, we're gonna do python manage.py run server. And we're gonna go and we need to add channels to our settings.py file. So go into settings.py, scroll down and go down to the bottom of the installed apps section and just write channels and add a comma there just in case you forget to add a comma next time you add some kind of an installed app. Now we need to build something, we need to build an ASGI application, which is how uh, Django channels uh, is served as. You know, actually, uh, now that I think about it, I might as well explain this a little bit. And I don't know this 100%, like I don't feel like I fully grasp what is happening here. So I'm just going to do my best to explain it. So right now our Django application is served as a WSGI application, web server gateway interface, and ASGI means asynchronous server gateway. Uh, gateway interface. ASGI is basically the natural successor to WSGI. Currently, the Django application that we're working with and all the old Django applications that exist out there on the internet are served as a WSGI, which is like the uh, the first version or the older version. ASGI is the new version. It's an asynchronous version of WSGI. So the way we have to handle web sockets and channels with Django is we have to serve the, I guess, the the channels or websockets functionality as its own entity so we're going to have like our regular django website which we've built so far but we're going to have like a separate entity i guess you could say or a separate a separate application that lives within our application uh, that runs the websockets and the channel stuff so that all sounds very complicated but it's actually very simple also assuming i explained that correctly because i'm not even sure if i explained that correctly but we are i do know how to configure this correctly so don't worry we can do that and uh, again, don't worry if that sounded complicated because I'm gonna show you everything that you need in this video. So now we're gonna, we're gonna work on setting up this ASGI application for Django channels to run in our project. So what we need to do is go into our, our main kind of root project directory here, chat server playground, and right click, and I'm gonna create a new file named routing. So pressing control S and calling this routing.py. 
Now inside of routing.py is where we build this ASGI application for our WebSocket. So first I'm gonna get some imports and I'm going to increase the font here so you guys can get a nice, a good view of what's gonna happen here. So from channels.auth import, and I'm going, I'm just gonna get the imports first and then I'm gonna talk about it and build the application. So from channels.auth import auth middleware stack. Again, I'm gonna talk about this. So just get these imports first and then we're going to uh, explain everything. So channels.routing import, whoops, import uh, protocol type router, also the URL router from channels.security. Uh, dot websocket websocket import allowed hosts or origin uh, validator and I'll talk about all this again just to remind you from Django dot URLs import path and there we go, that's, that's, that's our imports. So I'm gonna write out the first part of this. Well, actually, you know what, let's, uh, let's refer to the Django documentation because again, I think the docs do a really good job of explaining, you know, the documentation is quite long. You can see there's a lot of parts in this, but thank God you have me to explain this to you because I've been through everything here and I'm gonna condense this down nicely to you. So remember this documentation is very important. So let's go to uh, the routing section here. So routing and then protocol router. This is kind of the first step in setting up our ASGI application. So this should be the top level of your ASGI application stack and the main entry point for your routing file. It lets you dispatch to one of the number of ASGI applications based on the type value present in the scope. So this is how we define kind of what kind of an ASGI application we're building. Now they give two examples here, HTTP or WebSocket. Obviously we are gonna be using WebSocket. So let's set up that protocol type router now. So application equals protocol type router and open this up, do squiggly braces, and now just define it just like it says in the documentation. So you do WebSocket colon and then whatever that, uh, whatever that application is going to be or whatever that, yeah, whatever that application is going to be. So let's go back to the documentation. Now let's go over to the security tab here. This is in the security section and I have WebSockets selected on the left. So if you if you read through this, you'll learn a little bit about how it can limit the the payloads that the WebSockets can can send uh, through these kind of security options. The first security option that it gives you here is this origin validator. And what it does is you can see kind of the example here. We have the application just like we have, protocol type router just like we have. We have that web socket defined. And then it says there's that origin validator. So what this does is it adds security so that you have to list the sites or the domains that are gonna be able to use your WebSocket. So basically what you do is you use this origin validator and then you have to list down the domains down here that can use this WebSocket. So that's one option. Now we're not gonna use this option. We're gonna use kind of a subset of that or a subclass of that class, which is the allowed hosts origin validator. So this gets used the same way, except you don't need to list the domains at the bottom like you do up here. So remember here you have to lift, list those domains. This one you do not need to list the domains. So the allowed hosts origin validator, I bet you you can figure out this one. Uh, you probably guessed it. The This will only allow the domains that are listed in your settings.py file in the allowed hosts list. So if you don't know what that is, let me show you. So if we go to settings.py and you scroll all the way to the top, we have this allowed hosts list. Usually like if this was codingwithmitch.com, for example, if I only wanted this uh, these sockets to be able to use that codingwithmitch.com, I would write codingwithmitch.com. If I wanted these sockets to be able to be used on any website, I would do a star, that means all. Uh, but for us, we would do you know openchat.xyz or uh, also https, you know, open chat.xyz, uh, whatever X, whoops, XYZ, uh, whatever your domains were that you want to be able to use these WebSockets at. So for me, I'm going to, I'm gonna leave this blank for the development environment. And then when, it, when we go to push this to production, I'll need to add open chat.xyz to this allowed hosts list. And whatever your domain is that you launched to production, you'll have to add that too. So that's the second part. So let's, uh, let's write that in. So allowed hosts origin validator, and then open this up. And now we're ready to move on to the next part. So the next part, we're gonna go to this tab. This, this tab is what's new in channels two. And I have HTTP sessions with Django auth selected here. So if you scroll down, we have this thing called an auth middleware stack. So what is this auth middleware stack? So you can see the example here, you know, you have the protocol type router, you have the auth middleware stack. Um, 
now they have it inside of the first kind of child of the web socket, but that doesn't matter. Like we can put this right here and it's going to work just fine. So that's what we're going to do. We're putting this auth middleware stack inside of our allowed hosts origin validator. So what is this auth middleware stack? Well, if you read the documentation, you would learn about it, but you might not fully understand. Um, if you read this kind of cryptic paragraph, it says you need to replace, replace accesses to message HTTP session with self scope session message dot user with self scope user. There's no need to blah, 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 blah. You don't really understand. Anyway, what it really means is comparatively to like, if we go into any one of our views, uh, you know, I'll just go into, I don't know, go into account, go into views, anywhere where we have request.user, I'm sure you remember plenty of times that we've used request.user to access the authenticated user. So just kind of like we do this in the views, we can do this inside of our WebSockets code. Um, not this, not exactly this, but if we go back to the documentation, you can ac access it by calling self.scope and then the user. So it gives you access to the user object in the session within the context of your channels or your WebSocket kind of application. Basically, you can think of it as exactly the same functionality as you get with request.user. It gives you some more information. I, you know, it gives um, different kind of uh, payload options, but generally speaking, just kind of think of it as request.user. It's analogous to request.user. That's what this auth middleware stack will do. Now, the last tab that I have up here is URL router. So this is kind of the last piece of the puzzle that we need to set up our, our WebSocket application. Now this is very similar to how we set up URLs. So like just as an example, if we go to our code and we go to any of these like urls.py file, we have these URLs where we inflate different views. Well, similarly with WebSockets, you use URLs to tell the uh, Django uh, WebSocket tool what URLs you'll be able to connect WebSockets to. So that's, that's kind of the last parameter and I'm gonna write it into our code right now, even though uh, we won't, we're not actually going to write anything here yet. So I'm just going to leave a comment and say URL router, comment it out. And inside here, you know, we would do a list of all of the URLs where we're going to be connecting our WebSocket. So right now I'll just write empty for now because we don't have a consumer yet. And don't worry if you don't know what a consumer is. This is, this is a, a Django channels thing. This is how we uh, kind of build back end code for the web sockets to work. So don't worry if you don't know what that is, we're gonna be looking at that later. So now that we have our routing.py kind of set up, although we don't have any, we don't have any URLs in here, but we have kind of the general uh, structure all set up. I'm gonna press control S on that. I'm gonna go back to settings.py, scroll down to where the WSGI application is. So this is our like classic Django application that's being served right now. Now we wanna add a parameter called an ASGI application, all capitals, application and set that equal to what we just built. So that's going to be chat server playground dot uh, routing. So that's that routing.py file that we just created and then do dot application. So we're accessing this object that we just created right here and we're setting that equal to our ASGI application. So that's it kind of for the uh, Django channels kind of configuration at like the lowest level possible. We don't have a consumer yet. We, we have a lot of work still to do, but that's the general kind of setup. Now we want to set up Redis and what Redis is going to allow us to do inside of our project is imagine a scenario where you have a public chat room and you have, you know, any number of users connecting to that chat room. What Redis does is when one user sends a message to that chat room, say what Redis will do is it distributes the messages to everybody who is subscribed to that I don't know, let's say group. So basically you can think of Redis as sort of a, a message management system that will distribute uh, things to the other users who are subscribed to that to that socket in our case. So later when we go to push our website to production, setting up Redis is pretty simple because we're gonna be using a Unix operating system on our server. It's pretty simple. Redis is built to work on Linux. Um, so the problem here now is my development environment is in Windows. Probably a lot of your development environments are in Windows. Maybe you're on Mac. Um, now, the problem here is Redis does not work out of the box on Windows. I'm not sure about Mac. Obviously, Linux, it works. So what I'm going to do is show you how I, got to, how I got Redis to work locally on my Windows machine. But if you're on Mac, you're sort of out of luck because I don't have a Mac. Uh, so if it's not going to work, you're going to have to figure out how to get it to work. So getting Redis to work on Windows is surprisingly easy. There's this 
uh, I guess, third-party website, memri.com. I'm not sure if Microsoft uh, maintains this, but somebody does anyway. All you actually need to do is download this developer edition for Memori. Uh, so download the executable, run it, and once you have that done, uh, all you need to do to make sure that it's working um, is go to services. So open up your Windows services window and look for Menori. So there's our Memori and just make sure that it's running. And if it's not running, click start. So I can click on start just to make sure that this is running. It says it's running now. Boom. You know, Redis is automatically going to kind of magically work. Now, the last step to configure Redis with my Django project is we need to go into settings.py and set a channel uh, layers configuration variable. So set so say channel layers equal to a Python dictionary and now define default. And this is all in the uh, Django channels documentation, by the way, if you're curious about where I'm getting this from. Uh, backend and we want to do channels underscore Redis dot core dot Redis channel layer and then do comma and do config so config and then do another python dictionary so hosts uh, and then we want to add our our um, local ip so 127.0.0.1 and we don't have to do the port 8000 because we want to do the port that redis is working on so by default it's going to be working on port 6379 and of course you can check this stuff like when you installed it in the executable it asked you when or what port you want to use also if you access the windows service or the uh, win yeah the win windows service kind of window again look for memori and then go to properties you'll see that it's working on port 6379 so that's it let's add some commas comma 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 i'm not sure if i need those but those are in my notes so i'm going to add them and that uh, that's all we need to have redis configured to work with our project and the cool thing about this is this actually doesn't even change in production because when you install redis on linux on our linux server that we're going to push to production on uh, it still runs on on uh, locally on that server itself so all this configuration doesn't even change which is a cool thing so press Control s on that and we're ready to move on to the next part so in the next part we're going to start building those consumer things that i mentioned when we were setting up the routing.py file by the way if if this video is free if this video videos on YouTube. This is definitely going to be the last free video on YouTube. So if you want to watch the rest of this course, you're going to have to go to codingwithmitch.com to enroll. You're going to have to become a member. So codingwithmitch.com slash enroll. It's $30 Canadian to become a member, which is about $22 US per month. Uh, it's a subscription or you can pay yearly, which is $240 Canadian, which is I think $180 US per, per year. So it's a one-time fee per year. Um, so like in 365 days, you will get charged again unless you cancel your subscription. Totally worth it. You get access to everything on the website, completely unlimited access. You can download the videos. You get access to the members only Discord channel. So if you have any problems, you know, I'm in there every day with 50, 60, 70 other members. We're all helping each other. Um, I'm trying to work work at becoming better programmers. So yeah, go enroll right now. What are you waiting for? Totally worth it. And then I'll see you in the next video.